Well, hello and welcome to the CSF September monthly podcast. This month there are four papers uploaded to the CSF website, but today I'm going to highlight two of these which we think are of particular interest. Now, one paper investigates lipid profile alterations in people with rheumatoid arthritis treated with baricitinib and statins, some on, some off statins, and the other relates to the maintenance of disease control after methotrexate discontinuation with continued toclizumab therapy. Now, let's turn to the latter. First of all, it's a paper from Joel Kremer from the Center for Rheumatology in Albany, New York, and this is the compact study examining the efficacy of discontinuing methotrexate from tocilizumab combination therapy. This is in RA patients who've achieved low disease activity. Now, the background here, we've known from some time now that uh, tocilizumab is efficacious as a monotherapy or potentially as a combination with methotrexate in people with RA. Um, people frequently discontinue taking DMARDs, particularly methotrexate due to intolerance or adverse events. That is particularly with relevance to this study. Now, COMP-ACT is a randomized double-blind 52-week study evaluating the sustained efficacy of subcut tocilizumab monotherapy versus combination therapy following combination therapy. So patients received subcutaneous tocilizumab at 162 milligrams either weekly or every two weeks for 24 weeks after which treatment was discontinued for patients with a DAS-28 defined low disease activity. And they were randomized to receive thereafter continued tocilizumab monotherapy or tocilizumab in combination with methotrexate. The primary outcome was the comparison of the mean change in DAS-28 ESR between the two randomized groups at week 40. Key secondary endpoints, uh, a variety including the proportion of patients achieving worsening to DAS-28 ESR greater than or equal to 1.2, ACR 20, 50 or ACR 70 at weeks 40 and 52, and DAS-28 ESR less than 2.6 and less than or equal to 3.2 at weeks 40 and 52. And of course, there were safety assessments in there, including the incidence of adverse events and serious adverse events and the incidence of immunogenicity, a real issue when we think about discontinuing methotrexate therapy when patients are also receiving biologics. So the key results, well, 604 patients completed treatment until week 24 and 296 patients achieved low disease activity who were then randomized to receive either treatment arm. 119 patients were given tocilizumab monotherapy and 132 were given combination therapy who completed the study. Now from discontinuation to weeks 40 and 52, change in the DAS-28 and patients with worsening in DAS-28 were similar between the treatment groups. The proportion of patients who maintained DAS-28 ESR low disease activity or remission were similar between both therapy groups, except that low disease activity at week 40, which slightly favoured the tocilizumab plus methotrexate combo arm. Now, the mean CDI scores were similar between both treatment groups. ACR response rates were 8 to 11 percent lower in patients randomised to receive tocilizumab monotherapy versus combination therapy. The rates of normal and serious AEs were comparable between treatment groups. Infection was the most common adverse event, unsurprisingly, and occurred in 2.1% of patients given monotherapy and in 2.2% given combination therapy. So what do we take from all of this? Well, the mean change in DAS-28 ESR from weeks 24 through week 40 uh, were, were similar between patients randomised to either monotherapy or, or combination therapy. The safety outcomes were similar between the randomised treatment arms and consistent with the known profile of tocilizumab, so nothing new emerged. A slightly higher instance of adverse events in patients randomised to receive combination as opposed to monotherapy. And taken together, well, I think these data are consistent with the idea that patients achieving low disease activity with tocilizumab plus methotrexate could reasonably discontinue methotrexate while maintaining disease control for up to 16 weeks following discontinuation. Naturally, one would then wish to titrate that per the individual patient response as one always would if one were applying treat to target principles. 
Now, the second paper I'd like to highlight is the uh, effect of baricitinib and statin use on lipid profiles in people with rheumatoid arthritis. And the first author here is uh, Professor Peter Taylor, one of my dear friends and colleagues down in the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. Now, the background here, well, uh, we, we know that the use of anti-inflammatory drugs in people with rheumatoid has been shown to alter lipid levels and potentially reduce overall atherogenic risk. Increases in lipid levels, specifically high density lipoprotein cholesterol, HDLC, and low density lipoprotein cholesterol, LDLC, have been observed in phase two. So this study analyzed data from seven randomized phase two and phase three trials of baricitinib to assess the effect of baricitinib and or statins on lipid profiles, lipid particle size, number and levels of glycosylated acute phase protein, that's a, a glyc A assay, and also the effect of lipid alteration and cardiovascular risk, changes in risk scores, and the association between LDLC change and major adverse cardiovascular events, so-called MACE. And the data were pulled into three sets. There's a six study placebo controlled set, including 24 weeks of data from all phase two, three trials of placebo and four or two milligram baricitinib treatment arms. The long-term baricitinib cohort of patients randomized to baricitinib four or two milligrams and the long-term extension RA beyond. And the all baricitinib RA MACE set, including all phase three trials, and patients from RA beyond given at least one dose of baricitinib. Now, the key assessments uh, include the lipid levels for total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, triglycerides, apolipoprotein A1, apolipoprotein B and glyc A, and these were measured in each data set at baseline week 12 and week 24. And we were also interested in the effects of statins at baseline or when initiated during the study on the lipid profiles and cardiovascular risk analyzed. And the key results, well, baseline to week 12 lipid profiles in the six study placebo controlled set demonstrated dose dependent increases in total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, in triglycerides, in apolipoprotein A1 and apolipoprotein B. And these changes were sustained through week 24. And this was absolutely as expected from prior studies in the jacinib and indeed the IL-6 receptor blocking classes. No significant change in the LDLC HDLC ratio at baseline through week 12 or week 24. Now, what about lipoprotein change baseline to week 24 in the RA BEAM study? Significant increases were seen in LDLC and HDLC, as well as decreases in small LDL with baricitinib 4 milligrams and adalimumab versus placebo. And the glyc A levels were significantly lower in patients given baricitinib versus placebo, or for that matter, adalimumab. Now, lipid profiles for baseline statin use in the six study placebo controlled set, well, approximately 10% of patients were on statin therapy at baseline. There was no significant interaction effect between study treatment and baseline statin subgroups. So that's quite reassuring that the, the, the data are generalizable. There's no adverse effect of the, the baseline statin interaction. What about lipid profiles for statin initiators in the six study placebo controlled set for those randomized placebo and, and the long term cohort for those randomized to baricitinib? Well, after statin initiation, total cholesterol and LDLC returned to baseline levels, but HDLC remained elevated. The effects of statin therapy and LDLC and total cholesterol were comparable in the baricitinib and placebo groups. And in phase three, studies of the six study placebo controlled set, including the long-term extension, the effects of statin therapy and triglycerides and apolipoprotein B lipid levels were comparable in the baricitinib and uh, placebo groups. And finally, cardiovascular risk from baseline through week 24 in the phase three trials. Of course, this is a very small analysis set to be actually looking at risk scores and outcomes, but you can see that there is actually some significant within group decrease seen in the Reynolds risk score for baricitinib in all studies, um, adalimumab in the RA-BEAM study and placebo in the RA-BUILD study. 
Um, within group changes for the Framingham risk score were not significant. But remember, this is really a calculation of what happens to these risk scores when you input a different lipid level. So interpret this with caution. So how do we interpret all of this uh, overall? Well, baricitinib is associated with increased lipid levels, which seem to plateau by week 12. There are increases in HDL across all particle sizes, but the increases in LDL occurred in larger particle sizes. And that's important because it is the uh, smaller particle sizes which are more likely associated with atherosclerotic risk. And in fact, those, if anything, were decreasing in this analysis. Baseline statin use doesn't seem to modify the effect of baricitinib and lipids. And for patients initiating statin therapy during baricitinib treatment, total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol return to baseline levels, but HDL cholesterol remains elevated. I think it's important to be very cautious in our interpretation of this. We're still very early in the use of baricitinib in the treatment of people with rheumatoid and further evaluation of the effects of baricitinib on cholesterol and lipoprotein metabolism and cardiovascular event rates during long-term treatment really are essential and will help us in, in, in the longer term to elucidate these findings. Now, there's two other papers we've uploaded to the CSF website this month, a review of the efficacy of biologic and targeted synthetic DMARs as monotherapies in patients with RA, and a post hoc analysis of the results from RA Begin, assessing structural damage progression in RA patients achieving sustained responses with baricitinib alone or in combination with methotrexate. And these are, are authored by Paul Emery and Desiree van der Heide, respectively. Now, please don't forget that all the content I've discussed in this podcast is available in more detailed slide format and, and in short abstracts in the publication section at cytokinesignaling.com. Um, and please subscribe to our podcast channel and let us know what you think by reviewing the podcast. And finally, I, I really hope this is helpful to you in your clinical practice. At the end of the day, we're trying to bring the best current medical knowledge to bear when we are looking after our patients. Thanks very much indeed for your attention.